Good morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Sharper Iron is underwritten by the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. On this Tuesday, March 1st, we're studying Luke chapter 12, verses 22 through 34. Jesus comforts his disciples with the assurance that their Father knows what they need, and he will not fail to protect and provide for his little flock now and eternally. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us regular guest, Pastor Mark Bars. Pastor Bars serves at Crown of Life Lutheran Church in San Antonio, Texas. Pastor Bars, welcome back to Sharp Iron. Good morning, Pastor Apple. Great to be with you and with our listeners today. As we get started, let's talk a little context. What should we know about the Gospel of Luke, where we've been, uh, particularly leading up to this chap- this section of chapter 12? Well, our listeners regularly or occasionally have been studying Luke with us now since January, and we're moving along into March already. So there's, there's lots that have been covered, and yet we're pretty much still just in the, middle of, in the middle of the book. Probably the most significant thing would be to take them back to chapter 9, where after the transfiguration, Jesus has set his face to go to Jerusalem, a critical phrase in, in the Gospel of Luke, and it, it, becomes, it becomes the watershed time. So more immediately, Jesus has spoken to the crowds and to some particular individuals and warning, warned them against covetousness. Yesterday, there was this parable of the rich fool. And so there is a, a warning. There is caution against greed and against selfishness. And today, as we look at these verses, it's going to be how much worry is connected to those, how much a part of it that is. Uh, the world in which Jesus, to which Jesus spoke, the people to whom Jesus spoke, we think, well, my goodness, that's 2,000 years ago. That's, that's so different. It's not. <laughs> the world is the same. We are the same. The disciples, the disciples who strive and, and struggle to follow at times, uh, we need to hear the same word. So there's our context in, in the Gospel of Luke, but here we are in the church here. Uh, two days ago, many of us would have observed the festival of the Transfiguration, and even though that occurred earlier in the Gospel of Luke, it, it's within the church year. It's only a couple of days before us, and tomorrow is the beginning of Lent. Tomorrow uh, we are marked with ashes. Tomorrow we confess we confess our sins of worry and anxiousness, our sins of, of struggling and striving to get more and more, and we receive in the forgiveness of Christ the great treasure of the gospel. So I'm sure there's going to be times in our conversation today when, when Lent and the Ash Wednesday all being on the horizon are going to be part of our, part of our reflections Mm. With with the context that you mentioned, Jesus setting his face to go to Jerusalem back in chapter 9, and now that really does dominate this section of Luke as he travels that direction that's kind of always there in the background. I think that's particularly important with a text like we've got today, which is a, a familiar one, one that I know I find very comforting, and yet maybe one that's a little easier than some to disconnect from that context of Jesus going to the cross. So what it, and I know we'll talk more about this when we look at the text more specifically, but just as a, a way of introduction, how do, you, how do you think that the fact that Jesus is on his way to the cross affects the way that we take and use these words of not being anxious? That sounds so generic. I think we need to maybe be a little more specific w- given that context. That's a great question to ponder. So even when he says that, life is more than food and the body more than clothing, things that are so common to, to, the, to the human experience. And Jesus, true God and true man, has a physical life and he has a body. He is going to do something that his disciples are been told about. They're hearing the passion predictions. They're they're still going to be surprised. We know that because we've read the whole story. We've read the gospel more than once and heard it read and heard it preached. And so how, how is it that 
he will even he will even point others point us to himself is there even as we know that he will pray in the garden and and ponder what it means to give his to give his life away what he is willing to do and yet and yet this is this is so profound. I don't know that we can even begin to grasp it. And yet, after Easter, uh, life returns. The body is raised, and as we will come to that great festival and, and live in the Easter in the Easter confidence and joy and promise. We've heard many of us have heard from First Corinthians chapter fifteen in the last weeks up to Transfiguration Sunday words about about the body and about the resurrection and and. If Christ were not raised, then your faith is, is futile. But he's anchoring this in words about life and body and clothing and food. He's anchoring them in his own mission and his own journey to give life and to be the one who is the resurrection and the life and the one who promises us, even as we, even as we stand at gravesides, that mm -hmm. this body too will be raised and, and given life, new life and eternal life in the resurrection. Yeah, yeah. That, again, that's something to keep in our minds as we read these words, and I do think that that adds to the hopefulness and the comfort that is there for us. Looking at this text before we read through it, how would you how would you structure this text? How is it arranged as Jesus goes through these verses? Well, there's there's some maybe there's a, a division fairly fairly uh, significantly. He introduces it, and then he has it verse twenty four and verse twenty seven. Consider the ravens, consider the lilies. So he will use two images from nature to to make his to make his point, and then the it continues. I think with uh, the the contrast between what is little and things that are little, and what is more than and what is great. I would encourage our our listeners to be aware of that. And finally, though, it it seems to be that the two key verses are verse thirty two and verse thirty four. Uh, the words to the little flock and the father who is it's his good pleasure to give you the kingdom and finally where your treasure is there your heart will be also we are we are those who confess that Christ is the priceless treasure and uh, the world tempts us and the world and the word pulls us mm -hmm. and would say oh no there's other things that you should treasure and that you should cling to and and you are fools to not think so but but dare we be those who, who witness to the world, and must we be those who witness to the world what is of, what is of ultimate value, that, that it is Christ, it is the gospel, and it is that we are valued. It is the Father's good pleasure to grant his kingdom to us and call us his sons and his daughters. Mm, yeah. Before we start then, just these verses, how would you summarize them? What, what are we going to encounter? What's the main point of Jesus' words today? Well, there is anxiousness, and anxiousness is a is, is part of what lives in, we live in a fallen world. There is greed, there is discontent. Uh, I, you've heard me say, I think a few years ago, Pastor Apple, that the ninth and 10th commandments that speak to covetousness, that, that the theme word that I, I like to teach for that is contentment. The world, the world doesn't know contentment, but it's more than just being content with, I have enough to live on. I, I have decent clothes. It is, it is spiritual peace. It is, it is contentment, which is anchored in being one of the sheep of the good shepherd, one of the little flock. We receive the treasure, the treasure of the kingdom, a treasure that cannot be taken away from us, a, a treasure that we, we will only discover in eternity, how, how rich and abundant and, and never-ending and never that it is. Mm. Let's jump into the text. We are in Luke chapter 12, beginning at verse 22 today. And he, Jesus, said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? If then you are not able to do as small a thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. 
But if God so clothes the grass, which is alive in the field today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. That's our text for today. That's Luke 12, verses 22 to 34. So, Pastor Bars, again, just such comforting words here from our Lord. Uh, He starts, do not be anxious. What does that mean, do not be anxious? Well, we're going to hear it. It repeats itself in the words of Christ throughout throughout this section of the scriptures. Uh, anxious, do not be anxious. Which of you, by being anxious, a little bit later on, and in in verse in verse twenty four, it will happen again. Uh, verse twenty five. Excuse me. This this anxiousness uh, about worried about what we eat, what we drink, what we will what we will wear. The therefore is he has. Well, first of all, he has taken away from a larger group, uh, the disciples. Now, the disciples can mean a variety of things. It can mean the 12, and it does at many other times. We've heard not too far before this in Luke about the 72 that are sent out. So 72 plus 12, now we have now we have 84. But there's also a, a larger group of disciples, an unnumbered, uh, unnamed number of disciples. We know that from the accounts of, of the resurrection as well, that those who were who are caring for Jesus and the women who who bury him, who take care of take care of his body with Nicodemus, with Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, but he is no longer speaking to the crowds when he says to his disciples. I, I do suggest that it's a broader group of disciples, and that therefore is the contrast between this rich fool who thinks he has so much, but my goodness, he needs bigger barns, he needs more storehouses, and he has he has all the security that all the security that, that, he, could, that he could ever want. Um, how false it is and how tempting it is to find our security in the things we can touch and handle and hold on to. I'm convinced that essentially every advertisement, I suppose some of them are just to get the name out there, but, but so most advertisements are telling us you don't have enough you don't have the right thing. You need more. And, and we're, not, we're not impervious to that. It, it's, it's going to impact us. It's going to impact us as well. So what about the anxiousness? What about, what about this, this, uh, this, this concern that says, is this enough? Is this enough about your life, about what you eat, about what your, what your body, about what you will put on? Verse 23, but life is more than food and the body more than clothing. It, it seems as though when Jesus, is, when Jesus constructs this, I'll suggest that, that he gives us three reasons why not to be anxious. And here's the first one in verse 23. First of all, life isn't simply about your body. We, you and I know those, and, and our, our listeners know those. They know people who are, who are content, whose physical health is, is so weak, who who have far less than, than other people in the world or even in their own congregation and yet, and yet are, are filled with contentment. Your body, your life is more than food. It, life is more than being alive. The body is more than clothing. The second reason is to stop being anxious is, is to look and observe. Now, I'll come back to the word consider in a moment. Remind me if I, if I don't. But look, look at the world God has made. Look at how he cares how he cares for the world. So stop being anxious when you observe how he cares for ravens and there's flowers and there's grass, there's lilies. And the third reason is in, is in verse 25. Can you, do you really think that you can change your own life by adding a single hour, the ESV says, a single hour to your span of life, a, a day? The actual word is a cubit, which seems rather odd that it would be a measure, a linear measure and, and something of life, but it is used meta- metaphorically in that way, at, at least at some times that, that word can do that. So why, 
why are we called to not be anxious? First, life is bigger than the things we see and touch and grab. Second, look at the way God cares for and consider when when Luke uses that word, when, when Jesus speaks that word, it, it's, it's more than just think about this. It, and it's certainly more than, oh, consider, oh, by the way, look at this example. Glance over at the ravens or at the lilies. He, he's, saying, he's saying, well, the verb is a, is a rich word. Immerse yourself in, ponder this one, observe it and ponder it. It, it shows up in Luke's writing several other times. And one of the most interesting times, I think, is in Luke chapter 20, when, when Jesus is challenged by whether we should pay, pay taxes to Caesar or not. And, and Jesus is the one who carefully ponders, it, it uses that same verb, because he knows it's a trap. And then he says, well, show me the coin, who, whose image is on it, and so on. Uh, it's also the word that it, it's only used outside of Luke's gospel in one other time in the gospels, which is when Matthew tells us about um, telling your, your brother to get the speck out of his eye, but do you not notice the beam in your own eye? Consider that you've got this massive chunk of wood stuck in, stuck in your own eye. So consider, and it's that same, that same verb there is consider the ravens and consider the lilies. So, why why does he choose why does he choose these images? Uh, you know, I've, you've given me this text to study a, a while ago. So, I, ravens, ravens. Well, wait a minute, ravens. Let's see. Noah sends a raven out first from the ark. Ah, oh, there were ravens on the ark, and then that amazing story of Elijah being fed uh, by ravens carrying food, which which is really curious because ravens are scavengers. Right. All right, they're yeah. they're not they're not pretty little songbirds. Yeah, so 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 scavengers are the ones that are that are providing the food, and yet because they're scavengers, they 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 might you might think well well okay why would he use that as an example? It's well it's because because he he provides he provides for them too. He he cares he cares even. Even for ravens, which we might dismiss as being, I don't know, down here in down here in San Antonio, we want to get rid of the grackles. Yeah. I think the grackles <laughs> and the ravens must must be related. Must be related somehow. They're so annoying down on the down on the river walk, and 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 lilies, um, lilies, uh, wild lilies, perhaps. I I just did a little checking on this and go, okay. There's some scholars say it could be this kind of flower. It could be that kind of flower. Uh, there are 100 different varieties of lilies. And, and when, when Luke writes this, when Jesus speaks this, and when Luke writes this and talks about Solomon and all his glory, and you and I may have favorite flowers. I, I don't know. We're, we're, going, we're waiting soon. It's, right. it's already March, so we're waiting for blue bonnets to, to bloom. And, and we love the blue bonnets down here in, down here in Texas. But, but all the splendor that, that God has put into nature, all the colors, all the variety. Solomon would, would have envied that, would have in, in his glory and in his, in his splendor. And saying all of that to say, God cares for the birds. God clothes the flowers. He gives grass life. Yes, it, it may be here today and gone tomorrow, but God is the, the tender of that. I, I'm, taken, I'm taken to Luther and his explanation of the of the first article, how how God has made me uh, and given me body, soul, eyes, ears, and all my members, my reason, and all my senses, and still takes care of them. I, I'm taken to his to his explanation of the of the uh, daily bread in the in the in the Lord's prayer, and how how the daily bread. Um, I just maybe you and I have talked about this before, or some of our some of our other guests have. Daily bread includes everything that has to do with the support and needs of the body, such as food, drink, clothing, shoes, house, home, land, animals, money, goods, so on, so on. Somebody said it's the only uh, confession of faith in the church that mentions shoes. So <laughs> I, just, I, just think, I just think that's interesting. But then when he, when he ends it by saying uh, good reputation, good friends, faithful neighbors, and the like, yeah. well, what did he leave out? But, but this is the God who cares for us. This is... This is the God who, who knows who knows our needs, who, who, is, who is generous and, and gives us more, more than we need, even though the world tempts us to say, 
it's not enough and it's and it's never enough. And so they worry and they get anxious because greed prompts that. Mm. Yeah. The, the thing that I, I love about one of the things I love about this section is the tone that Jesus takes as he does this. You know, it, it is a it is a command. Do not be anxious. But his his tone, I think, is not one of you better stop being anxious or else. But rather he he invites us to recognize just how much we have from God and and then compares that to how much God does for for things like ravens and lilies that are far less than we are. And, and certainly he'll do more for us. I, I've heard one pastor, I think it was Pastor Brian Wolfmuller, suggest that that Jesus is is teasing us a little bit here, particularly with the one about the uh, adding a, a cubit to your life or an hour, you know, like say you go to the doctor and, and you're having a lot of stress and, and you say, well, doctor, how, how do I improve my quality of life? He says, well, you need to worry a little bit more. I mean, we laugh about that. And it's almost like Jesus is, is teasing his disciples and us a little bit. You know, do you really think your life's going to be better if you worry about it more? Come, come on, take a look at all these things that God does. And I, I really appreciate you bringing out Luther in his explanation to both the first article and the the fourth petition it struck me one time when i was i was driving my boys to school one morning and we had about a 20 minute drive to get there and so we would spend that time working on their memory work and they were memorizing the that explanation to the first article and so in order to do that because they couldn't read yet i did it repeat after me and when you start to you do repeat after me and you say it really slowly that i believe that god has made me in all creatures he has given me my body and soul eyes, ears, and all my members, my reason and all my senses. And you have to be really deliberate. You, you start and like, wow, all of this and even more and the like when you get in the fourth petition, all of this and more God has given to me. I mean, there, there's an antidote for worry that is much gentler, kinder than just saying, hey, you better cut it out. Don't worry because this is who God is for you. Well, perhaps we, perhaps when we hear imperatives, you, you've given us a great a great insight there, and in, in the the gentleness of the tone, because imperatives when 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 we hear you know, don't do this or stop doing stop doing this, uh, do not be anxious, uh, th- those are law words, and, and yet how they're framed. And what Jesus uses to support them is is very different than wagging his finger at us. He's 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 using it. He's using it to reveal that that care and that goodness and that generosity of of the God who who has given us life, uh, physical life, spiritual life, and and blessings blessings uncounted. Uh, there is just this. Uh, this interesting, this interesting thing. It seems, it seems to me about going back to that. Uh, can you add a little bit to your life? And and then Jesus says, if you, verse twenty six, if you are not able to do as small a thing as that, uh, one one version that I looked at said, this tiny little thing. Mm. Well, to even change the length of your days or or the height and. You know my you know my little joke. I'm stuck at I'm stuck at five seven and three eighths, and I used to put five eight on my driver's license. I was rounding up by more than half an inch, and my conscience said, "Stop doing that! Stop doing that!" <laughs> I talked to an FBI agent who's a member of our congregation. He says, "No, it's not a federal offense, so, so it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have been too bad." But to 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 want to want something to want something more, and to think that even if we could, it's it's such a little thing. And look at the great things yeah. that God has for us and, and will do for us. And to provide to provide each day that is that is not that is not a little thing. Are, are we reminded and we'll you'll you'll study it later on in, in Luke about only Luke has the story, right? Of the of the widow, of the widow's mm-hmm. the widow's offering and and her two little offerings, and she's criticized because why? Because she didn't save something for the next day, to buy her bread for the next day. She had such trust, such such confidence in our Lord's care, in, in being a child of the Heavenly Father, that she could give that give that gift. Yeah, I, I come back here 
to the Beatitudes that Jesus speaks in Luke chapter 6, the Sermon on the Plain. You know, blessed are you who are poor. Blessed are you who are hungry and who weep and are hated. And, and particularly those first two, the poor and the hungry, come through, I think, very clearly here again. And, and well, how, how could I be blessed in that state? Well, here's the way. God gives. You know, he, the, he gives the food. He gives the clothing. He's taking care of these ravens, these scavengers. He's clothing the grass with lilies, and it's going to be gone tomorrow. Surely he's going to give to you as well. And I mean, I think those those Beatitudes and Luke, it's amazing how they, they do seem to keep popping up in, in one way or another. And then, of course, that that contrast, I don't know if you mentioned this just yet. I know you brought up the, the rich fool, but the, the contrast in with the ravens, you know, imagine the, the ravens building these little barns. <laughs> you know, Jesus said, they don't do that. And, and this rich fool did, he, he, he died. You don't have to worry about that because God is giving you what you need. And I, I appreciate the way you connected it to the, the daily bread. This is, this is daily bread for which his disciples have been taught to pray in Luke chapter 11. And so, yeah, trust, trust the Lord. Don't worry because he gives you what you need. And so we'll keep talking about this and more of the text on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron here on KFUO. We're talking about Luke chapter 12 today with Pastor Mark Bars. We'll be right back. Please stick around. Did you know that Lutherans are helping new American immigrants get settled? How about struggling church workers in need of support and refreshment? And we assist at-risk children and provide disaster response to hurricane victims. Through LCMS recognized service organizations, we are doing all this and more. I'm Rahema Kavuga of Lutheran Church Extension Fund, and I don't want you to miss out on hearing what your brothers and sisters in Christ are up to. Visit interesttime.org to see how your support gives life to these works of mercy and love. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Tuesday, March 1st. We are studying Luke chapter 12, verses 22 to 34 with Pastor Mark Bars. He serves at Crown of Life Lutheran Church in San Antonio, Texas. Pastor Bars, prior to the break, we're looking at Jesus' words here in Luke 12. And you you mentioned about Jesus calls it a little thing to add an hour to your span of life or add a cubit to your height. It seems like a a big thing to you and me, but Jesus calls it a little thing. And this this thought of what's little, what's big, seems to, to show up in other places in this text. How does that theme come up repeatedly in these verses? Well, one way that not, that, not that we want to use this as a finger pointing exercise, we, we, we're too, too tempted to do that. But it is a contrast between the way the world sees things and approaches things. The, the way the world wants to make certain things big, I should be concerned about what I have, how much I have, and and is it enough? Well, it will never be enough. Uh, covetousness will always want me to will always tell me to want more. So, so what the world makes is big, and, and even such things as as food or clothes. I suppose it'd be homes. Uh, what what the world calls big, Jesus in these words is saying. That, that's a little thing. For my people, that's a little thing. Well, why? Because I'm the one who provides for you. I'm the one who cares for you. I, I care for ravens. Ravens cared for Elijah. I even care for ravens. Uh, lilies that, that bloom, flowers, varieties of flowers, all those that, that make this creation, my world, my creation, even, even, more, even more delightful to experience. I even care for those. Yes, even grass that you're going to throw into your ovens and, and light a fire with. But I, I gave that I gave that grass life. So what the world sees as big, God makes little on the same way the things that the world calls little, they're not directly in our in our text in this section, but things that the world calls little sin, guilt, shame, uh, brokenness. Death, death is little because we push it aside. We 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 don't want to talk about it. We don't want it. We don't want it to be. We don't want it to be near to us. Our Lord says, "No, these are the big things, 
and this is my answer to those as well. I not only care for you physically, but I promise and I point you to the cross. Lent again, Ash Wednesday tomorrow. Come, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Those, those great words from Hebrews chapter 12. He points us to the, to the big things that, that when the world makes little about our brokenness and our need for reconciliation, he says, I've got that one. I, and this is where we're going on this fourth day journey, a journey to the to the cross and to the open tomb. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that that really connects with the word that shows up several times in the ESV in, in verses 29 through 31, that word seek, you know, do not do not seek what you are to eat and drink and there don't be worried. All the nations seek these things. Your father knows you need them. Instead, you you seek his kingdom. You know, where where are your eyes focused? That that Lenten theme that you brought up and as we know again that Jesus is here having his face set to Jerusalem toward that cross, we have our eyes fixed on Jesus. And so when our eyes are fixed on Jesus and we are following him, that does mean, as Jesus has said earlier in Luke, to daily pick up our cross and follow him. And if if sometimes that means that maybe I'm not sure where my food is coming from today, where what I'm going to drink, where my clothing is coming from, I know the one I'm following. And I know who my father is. And so I can keep my eyes fixed on his kingdom. I can seek that. And I know that my father's going to provide these other things that, that yes, the, the world says are, are huge in the eyes of, of Christ. They're, they're little because he's, he's giving them to me. And so I don't need to be worried. So when we seek, it's even possible though. And, and I, I, I I'll confess this and, I don't know who's listening and who's who is listening on this morning, but even my seeking can be done with anxiousness because I because I I think it's something I have to be doing if I'm seeking the wrong things. And that's where we'll come to the end and and to seek the um, seek the kingdom in in verse in verse 31. So seeking seeking things that are only temporary versus things that are that are lasting in verse 29 it, it sounds as though it's maybe much the same and i'd just like to point out that you know the word anxious is is there in in earlier portions of these verses but he, verse 29 ends nor be worried and and there's this is a this is a, a rich word it's curious that it only it only shows up one time one time in the gospels it's it's an idea of this it, it, it's wavering between Hope and fear, mm-hmm. and 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 what what does worry do? Uh, worry says, "Oh, everything's going, to, everything's okay, everything's going to be okay." No, what's not? And and it's going to come out in, in the worst possible way. Walking by walking by faith and not by sight, what what we see would terrify us, or or it would give us pride because we say we can we can handle that. That's maybe a a tangential tangential aspect of that. But but to do this, but to do this, this is what the nations do. This is what mm-hmm. now the nations that that's one of those words too that you scratch your head and say, well, what nation are we talking about? Well it's it's the Gentiles. It's right. it's it's the non covenant people of God, which is how which is how a Jew would have understood that. Anyone who is not who is not uh, part part of the covenant people of God. The nations seek, the nation, and the nations are never satisfied. But once more, why are we not anxious? Maybe this is the fourth reason. I only listed three before. Your father knows that you need them. Your, your father knows this. Just as it's human fathers, your, your children younger, my children adults now, uh, still we, we know the things that they need. We want to do our best in that vocation and that God-given vocation as fathers. To, to care for them, how much more does our Father know, capital F, our Heavenly Father, know what we need? And so worry and, and the seeking, uh, do not seek with this anxiousness and, and do not worry, do not be wavering between hope and fear, but trust and rely and, and rest in the truth that our Father, your Father, my father knows what we need. 
the the use of father there and it shows up again and, and Jesus inviting his disciples to consider God as as their father again is such a, a rich invitation and it it makes my mind go back again to Luke chapter 11 where Jesus gives the Lord's prayer and he teaches them there to call God father and and within that context of the Lord's prayer I mean I think a couple of things are are applicable again the daily bread for which he teaches us to pray and then following that his instruction concerning prayer about you know ask seek and knock so I mean and I think that again that that adds color it helps us to understand these words to not seek after these things is that doesn't mean they're unimportant you you do need food you do need clothing how will you receive them from your heavenly father so ask him ask him for these things and know that he will provide them and and know that he will do so through ordinary means such as you know work and i do think that that's one thing at least worth mentioning briefly is that Worry is one thing and work is another. Jesus says, don't worry, don't be anxious, but he does not say, don't work. We should work. Work is a gift of God. And I, I, I've i reflected on this a couple times in, in Bible class recently, and I, I think sometimes we get it reversed, where we do the worrying and forget to do the work. Rather, we should do the work and let God do the worrying. And sometimes I think we we flip-flop it. So and I, I just think that's just an important thing to bring out here, because sometimes— and I'm not sure if it's our American context or, or what context it is, but we hear don't be anxious and we think, oh, that, does that mean I shouldn't work? No, no, work, but don't worry. And to seek, and to seek what? What does the world seek? What does the world seek? This world seeks things and possessions and finds and thinks that they will find security in them, but, but will never have enough and will never be satisfied. But instead, verse in verse 31, Instead, seek his kingdom. Just a little key word, transitional word. Rather, rather this, not this. Seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Sadly, there, there are those who, who, who in, in the broader sphere of the Christian faith and uh, might say, well, seek his kingdom and look what will be added to you. And the whole, the whole idea of prosperity theology, which is so... So apart from from anything that that our Lord would our Lord would teach us, but rather that God will care for you. God will care for you. he that that's what he does. He cares for he cares for his people, not not by way of abundance, but the food, the drink, the clothes, those these things are taken care of. But seek his kingdom kingdom languages all over the the gospel of Luke. And, and that's probably been something that our other your other guests have had comments on from from uh, from the beginning of of Mary of Mary exclaiming uh, or the angel exclaiming to Mary of his kingdom there will be no end and and uh, to the very to the very end of the gospel uh, and Jesus saying today you will be with me in paradise the only words that that Luke includes are words that Luke includes alone it doesn't say kingdom remember me when you come into your kingdom that criminal says today you'll be with me in in paradise so kingdom not not in an earthly sense not in not in a place of, of power or control or or status but in a new relationship in in a a relationship with the god who cares provides redeems calls fear not little flock so how can Jesus call us the little flock? This is the same Jesus. And this is one of my favorite verses from the Gospel of Mark. When he saw the crowds and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. That's the, the, the prelude to the, the feeding of the 5,000 in the Gospel of Mark. But the little again, the, the diminutive, the, the little flock, and, and, and not, not in a demeaning way, but I think in a, in a gentle way, this the shepherd sees this flock that he will give his very life for uh, the shepherd who will lay down his life for the sheep. And then it is the father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Why do we not fear? Look what the father, look what the father has done. It's, it's his good pleasure. This is the same language that is used earlier in the gospel of Luke at, at Jesus baptism in the Jordan. That when he, when he says, you are my son with you, I am well pleased. It's, it has that same, and to think that, that we are those sons and we are those daughters. And, 
and the, the, the father who, who looks at, at Jesus standing in the Jordan River with John the baptizer, looks at us at the font and says, you, I am, I am well pleased with you, not because we acted right, not because we cleaned up well, but because of his heart, his heart of love and his mercy, his mercy and his grace, his good pleasure to give you the kingdom, not to give you a series of, of steps to attain the kingdom, to, to do all the right things. Uh, but we would, we would sometimes almost like it that way because we are, we are bent in on ourselves, curved in on ourselves. And we want to do what is right. That was Luther's, that was Luther's torture for years, uh, how he could be, how we could earn favor with God. But no, it's the pleasure of the Father, his gracious will to give us the kingdom. Yeah, that, I mean, just the, that word give right there, I think is, is so huge that it, it's not that you have to earn it by not being anxious or, or, I mean, you know, earn it by anything, but it is his His good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And the connection there to Jesus' baptism and then our own is just such, what a what rich gospel language. Again, there's there's a reason that this this is one of the most comforting passages for many in the gospel of Luke. And then, you know, I mean, that little flock that that yes, he cares even for this this little flock. He's he's speaking to his disciples as you pointed out, a smaller group than the crowd. And and yet you, dear little flock, you know, I mean, however big a congregation may be, this little flock of God's people, he loves them and it is his good pleasure to give to them his kingdom. Now that that does have an effect then on, on the way that we live. And I think this, you know, verses 33 or verse 33, we've heard language like this from Jesus before, but again, connecting it here, particularly with his eyes focused on the cross, adds more richness to it. What, what is, how does it connect selling possessions, giving to the needy? Well, it's the last thing the world wants to hear. And, and it's the last thing that the people of God sometimes want to hear, too. It, it, means, it means to let to let go of the things that we think will give us confidence in this life and, and to and to let those let those possessions go and give to the needy. One of the one of the themes during the Lenten season is is the giving of alms. It's what we'll hear in our Ash Wednesday reading. Many of us from from the Gospel of Matthew, when you give, when you give, when you pray, when you give. Uh, so what is it what does it mean to to give to the needy uh, i'll suggest that it's an opportunity for us to as uh, words that I, I think i attribute to them to gene veith about vocation is that god is hidden in vocations and christ is hidden in our neighbor so so to care for the needy to give to the needy is to serve christ uh, even in light of I know we're bouncing around here in light of Matthew 25, when he says, those at my right and those at my left, and when you, you did this for me, and they say, how, when, what were we doing? Y you were serving. You were, you were serving others. You were living your vocation and caring, and ca caring for others. Now, provide yourself with money bags that do not grow old. So interesting, because in chapter 10, when he sends out the 72, he says, mm -hmm. carry no money bag. No knapsack, no extra sandals. When he sends out earlier the 12 in, in chapter 9, take nothing for your journey, no staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, but you receive the welcome of people in their homes, is what he, what he would tell the disciples then. But, but he's not telling us to, to literally stitch up some new, some new possession and throw it over our shoulder or tuck it in our back pocket as our, as our wallet. But this treasure, this treasure is a lasting treasure, and it is the, the treasure that is, that is given to us in our hearts. It is the treasure of, of forgiveness. It is the treasure of, of confidence in the, in the love of Christ that is, that is ours, not because we deserve it, but he, we are never loved because, because we deserve it, but loved in spite, of, in spite of who we all. And no thief can steal this. No, no thief, no thief can can take it away from us. It's a treasure far greater than that. It seems trivial to say a no moth destroys, but but here it's once more one of those little things, yeah. one of those little things that the world worries about, and, and the world at the time of Christ maybe differently than we do, who would measure their wealth in their garments. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's it's not insignificant that 
that the father gives the garment out of his own closet to his son when the, when the runaway son comes home in, in Luke chapter 15. But, but a moth could destroy, even something tiny could destroy something that I thought was so valuable. Nothing can touch the treasure that is ours in Christ. Now, the last, the last verse of this text, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also, is perhaps so simple and so profound at the same time. It, it is interesting that, that it does change from the, the is to the will be, and your, where your treasure is, there also your heart will be. That's, that's actually the last word. In, in the Greek there, there also your heart will be. And we see it and we see the evidence of it and, and how blessed it is to see the lives of saints around us who, who give witness to this. I, I remember dear souls from back at Bethlehem in Saginaw, Michigan, Ralph and Renata Wolf. Uh, he, had, he was a General Motors worker and had retired from General Motors. They were, they were at, at every worship service we ever had, I'm sure. And, and they were also in their, in, their quiet, in their quiet way. The treasure of the good news was so rich to them that they shared their treasures, never in a way that caused and brought attention to themselves, but always, always generously and, and willingly to, to give because of the treasure, loved they could love, made rich made rich in Christ made rich in Christ they they could give don't you also think uh, when we hear this word about treasure uh, i i have to turn to philippians philippians chapter 3 where where paul says that he counts everything as a loss everything that he could count up to his gain to his credit in his jewishness and and all of that it's all a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And that's where we are going, aren't we? In these Lenten days, in these Lenten days that stand before us. Mm, yeah, this is, I mean, this is really an excellent preparatory text for the season of Lent as we think about that, you know, that self-denial, the, the repentance that comes during that season to know that we have been cared for by Christ and that when he is our treasure, our heart is with him, and nothing can destroy it, and that treasure is worth far more than anything else we could ever want. What a what a glorious way to enter into the season of Lent. We've got about seven minutes, Pastor Bars. As you reflect on, on this text, and we've talked about its tone and uh, the way Jesus speaks and what he's saying, how do, how do we see Jesus preaching both law and gospel in these verses? Well, the law, the law is there whenever we know that we have to be, uh, we have to be accused and are accused of, of our own anxiousness, of our covetousness versus contentment, uh, of, our, of our greed, rather than being, rather than being able to say, uh, it's, it's enough. I was, I was reading some reflections on that between a couple of people I know, one of them being my, my oldest daughter, that you know too, and it was just some things that she had she had shared on her on her blog about about being about enough. What what is what is enough? And and the temptation the temptation is is always is is always there. So so to to have a treasure and to rejoice and to rejoice in a treasure that is that is more than we can ask and imagine or imagine as as Paul writes as Paul writes to the Ephesians. I do think that maybe we hurried past this a little bit, a little bit too much in the first part of that, is that this whole life and body, Jesus, Jesus doesn't say that physical life is not important. It is. We talked about that a little bit with his, the language of Luther in his explanation of the, of the creed, of the first article of the Apostolic Creed. But, but God is the one who, who shaped and formed Adam and Eve and, and is, is our creator and numbers our days. And, and before you were, as he says to Jeremiah, I knew you even while you were still, still in the womb. But physical life is important because it is God's gift. But, but life is more than, 
than what we think we need to have. And, and he doesn't say your body has no value. That's not what, that's not what Jesus teaches. That's not what, what scripture teaches. But our body's worth isn't determined by your age or your size or, or the clothes you wear. But your body, your body is given. Your body is given value. And, and that's where we're going. That's where we're going during these Lenten days as well, as we watch the willingness of our, of our Savior, who, who becomes the Lamb of God, who will take away the sin of the world, who, who gives his own, his own body into suffering and torture and, and thorns and nails and spear. And, and yet that body that's placed in the tomb, that body is, is raised on the third day, that body is, is resurrected, and it is the, he is then the first fruits once more, language we've heard during these epiphany, during the past epiphany season of, of the, the resurrection body that, that we are promised and that we are given and that we can have hope and, and comfort in when we, are, when, we are faced, when we are faced by death. I, I think that resurrection body, the resurrection of the dead is, is what, I mean, that's what's really in view here when Jesus talks about, you know, this life is more than food, this body more than clothing. And I, I can have that attitude because I know that even though this body will die, it will suffer like my Lord's body suffered and died. Yet just as my Lord's body was raised from the dead, so will mine be. And, and that gives me that comfort, that assurance, that steadfastness, that faithfulness that we'll need. We're, we're going to see that in tomorrow's text. That, that promise allows me to endure now without worry, but rather this great hope and comfort and, and trust in, in my Savior. Now, Pastor Bars, we've got about three minutes here on the morning. Help us to, to wrap things up. I know you love to, you love to bring out hymn texts for us. Uh, so help us to wrap things up in this section of Luke chapter 12 with, some, with just this fantastic news. This coming Sunday, I, I, hope, I hope that across all the congregations, and I, and I hope there's not just Lutherans listening to us as well, but, but to sing A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And, and this, this final stanza... The, the second half of the final stanza. And take they our life, goods, fame, child, and wife. Though these all be gone, our victory has been won. The kingdom ours remaineth. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. There are a couple of hymns right next to each other that, that say that. They they use these texts and they use the words of Matthew as well. Uh, one is number 735, have no fear, little flock. Uh, it's, it has a, there's a long backstory for this hymn for me and for my wife uh, that, that makes it always significant when we, when we sing it. But have no fear, little flock. Uh, have no fear, little flock. Have good cheer, little flock. Praise the Lord high above. Thankful hearts raised to God. For he stays close beside you in all things works with you, thankful hearts raised to God. That's followed up by a hymn by Steve Starkey, 736. Consider how the birds above, he takes, he takes the language from, both from Matthew and from Luke and weaves it into a marvelous text. But here is, here is what I would close with and make this our prayer. This is a wonderful Lenten hymn. It's by Thomas Kingo. It's number 422. On my heart imprint your image, blessed Jesus, King of grace, that life's riches, cares, and pleasures never may your work erase. Let the clear inscription be, Jesus crucified for me. Is my life my hope's foundation, and my glory and salvation? Amen. Pastor Mark Bars is pastor at Crown of Life Lutheran Church in San Antonio, Texas, helping us today with Luke chapter 12, verses 22 to 34. Pastor Bars, thanks for being our guest today. You're very welcome. God's blessings to you, my friend. I am your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. If you have any questions about Luke chapter 12 or any of the gospel according to St. Luke, please send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org or use the open mic feature on the app to send a message to us. We always love to hear from you. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again tomorrow.